thank you very much, Director Kukrit. Uh, let me start by giving honor to whom honor is due. Talking about the Chancellor of Covenant University, Dr. David Poyedepo, the Chairman Board of Regents, the Vice President Education Living Faith Church Worldwide, Mrs. Faith Oyedepo, the Olota of Ota, uh, members of the Board of Regents of Covenant University, management, staff, faculty, and students of Covenant University, and of course, everybody that is connected and listening to this presentation today. I will just take a moment to share the PowerPoint presentation that I'll be using in sharing with us briefly today on the topic as earlier announced. So uh, I'll be speaking to the topic, how talents will be developed via technology post COVID-19. Still talking about the future of education. Like uh, Dr. Stephen Olua to be rightly mentioned, uh, in the first and second series of uh, the EduTech. So I'll be running with this very brief agenda. Uh, we'll so that I have 45 minutes for presentation. I'll try to keep with it that time. Less the time for setup that we just had. Because we're talking about an institution called Covenant University. So I'll tell us a brief about Covenant University, uh, tell us about some external validations we've had as an institution to date. Then I will focus on the topic of the day proper. I will talk about the need for disruption, then I will conclude. About Covenant University, uh, while the Director Kukrid was making his introductory remarks, he talked about our vision. We are a leading world-class Christian mission university committed to raising a new generation of leaders in all fields of human endeavor. That is our core mission. But to achieve this core mission, we have what we call our core values, seven of them to be precise. We have the core value of spirituality, which speaks to the fear of God. We have the core value of possibility mentality. In this core value, what we try to ingrain in our students is that if you can, if you can uh, conceive of an idea, if you believe it, that is, you have faith that it can be done, you will receive it, that you will accomplish it. So we don't believe in Covenant University that something is impossible. Then we have the core value of capacity building, talking about skills development. This presentation today will speak uh, more to that. Talking about the core value, our fourth core value of integrity. It talks about leading by example. Responsibility is our fifth core value. That is, we do things and we are not as convenient. And uh, we have diligence. We believe that hard work pays. The vision of Confident University was uh, given in a new light when we turned 10 years old. That in the year 2012. The board of the institution came up with an a more realistic vision, if you will, to become one of the top 10 universities in the world by the year 2022. That is in two years from today. And we'll call that vision uh, one of 10 in 10. Getting this vision, we started running with it. And in running with it, we took some steps. And those steps have culminated in some external validations, which I'll be sharing with you now. We believe very seriously in being abreast of the facts of the issues we are concerned with at Covenant University. So as an institution, when the vision was given, we signed up with arguably the best ranking body that ranks the parameters that we want to rank by, talking about. So we signed up for Times Higher Education data points. What I'm showing on my screen right now is uh, the ranking of Covenant University as at 2017, 
when we were not even in the ranking yet, but we were working with the data to see where would we be in the ranking if we had met all the necessary conditions to be in the ranking. As you can see underlined in blue, Covenant University that year would have ranked in uh, 800 plus out of 981 institutions worldwide. And in Nigeria, it will have been the first of two institutions from the country. That continued on 20, uh, in 2018, when we had not yet met the criteria for entering the rankings, and uh, we will have ranked 801 to 1,000 out of 1,102. Still the first of two institutions in Nigeria. Then came 2019 when we actually entered the ranking. When we entered the ranking in 2019, we entered at a very uh, good place, uh, top 800 out of 1,258 institutions. And uh, for this year's ranking, 2020, Covenant went up like at 200 places to be at the top 500 institutions, being the first out of four institutions in Nigeria. This becomes uh, interesting to note because of these four institutions, only Covenant University is a private university. So in 2019, when we entered the ranking, as you can see in the World University rankings, we were 501 to 600, but in 2020, we went up to 301 to 400. These are now in the subject rankings. In that same year that we came into the ranking, we were privileged to join two subject rankings, talking about engineering and technology and business and economics. In both of the rankings, we went up like 200 places uh, when you do the year on year comparison. But come 2020, the second year we're in the rankings, we added three new subject rankings, talking about the computer science, social sciences, and physical sciences. So in all, we have five different subject rankings for Covenant for 2020. There's a demography of rankings called the Emerging Economist Rankings, and uh, in the debut, we were 151 globally among the emerging economies, but we went up 60 places in the second set of the ranking by becoming number 91 in the world. And another demography talking about the young universities rankings where they rank only institutions that are less than 50 years old. I believe this is actually our demography uh, because we're a very young institution, just 17 years old. Well, we'll see what the new ranking will be on the 24th of June, 2020. By the way, anybody listening can join in to see the full reveal of that ranking when it comes out in June. Another set of rankings came out last year. They're called the impact rankings. Why is this so important to us at Covenant University? All the rankings have been talking about measured research. These particular rankings called the SDG impact rankings measure the impact of our institution, both on the local community and on the global community. So in the very first year that ranking came out last year, we participated in it. That's why you can see this logo in overall participants and we came up with 301 plus in eight different SDGs, as you can see here. But this year we went a notch further by participating in 12 different SDGs and we came tops in quite a number of them as you can see. This is very important to us because it shows us that we're not just doing research for research sake, we're doing research for the purpose of impacting the community and this is showing. And these are things that are measured globally. I just to give you uh, a little bit of detail into how the ranking is done, I decided to show you the 17th SDG, that's partnership for the goals. One of our strongest, actually. You, you, if you understand how the box plot works, you see Covenant University's rank here. This is global. Uh, the box plot is for every single country, 767 of them that participated in this ranking in the world. And Covenant University is way up there being 201 to 300. And something very, very significant is that we scored the highest mark possible when you're talking about relationships. 
for the goals, which measures how we are prepared to collaborate with people to fulfill the SDGs as it is. So when it comes to our own region, talking about Africa, last year we were number six in Africa. This year we are number four in Africa. And uh, I put some of these things on my LinkedIn page and I got a response from somebody saying, oh, how does this happen with a very young institution like our own? That's why I've put this up now for you to see. A lot of the ranking uh, data they use, the proxies for the publication that is the research output of the institution. And I decided to show you here how the Covenant University research output in engineering since 2014 matches that of 60 other institutions in Nigeria, which is why we can see the type of rankings we are seeing for the institution. So let's dive into the, the topic proper after laying that background. That just uh, telling you the institution where this is coming from that uh, we are at the forefront of uh, given education the way it's supposed to be given in our context. The future of education. What is the future of education? I will be uh, taking too much on myself if I say equivocally that uh, I know the future of education, especially in the times that we have now. I believe nobody knows definitely the future of education because we are in chaotic times and when uh, nothing is certain, anything is possible. Most so with the level of technology that we have now, things change per second, per second. As I said. So the future of education, what I will be talking about here today are my own new things, my own thinking of uh, how I think things will go on the education landscape. And I'm not limiting it to Nigeria, I'm not limiting it to West Africa or Africa. I'm talking about global education landscape. Some things are very obvious and we can uh, take some cues from it. Okay, so let's take a little bit of a perspective, the education system in the past, in the present, and in the future. In the good old days, the child knew it all. The stage is on the stage and is just telling the students what it thinks they need to know. They have to memorize it and more often than not, when the testing comes, they give it back to it. A lot of places, that's still what obtains today, but that is not what it needs to be. Students were encouraged to be friendly to the lecturers. Curious students got into trouble, and taking an authorized initiative was very punishable. But in the present and going into the future, what should be the things we are looking at in an education system? We should be emphasizing critical thinking, where the students spend more time learning how to organize their talks coherently and how to present their cases when they need to. Communication skills, so to say. Everyone embraces the importance of curiosity. That is a key word here. The, 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 the desire to know, the desire to learn. Technology use becomes all pervasive for content access and content delivery. The teacher of the present and the future must be technically savvy, must know how to work with these things because of the generation we are trying to impact. And more emphasis on knowledge applicability for skills development. It's all about other skills. So the teacher we're talking about in this emerging dispensation will be one that is able to impart skills of critical thinking towards lifelong learning. And this become very, very important. Statistics has it that uh, people of my age group, for example, myself, have been in this institution for the past 17 years. That is not what obtains today. Statistics has it that uh, the new generation of workers will change their work environment between 10 and 15 times in their work lifespan. So it becomes very, very critical to be able to learn, 
unlearn as things change, and relearn to get new skills. So any teacher who is able to impart that will be the teacher for the future. You are that teacher that is able to teach the student how to learn, not what to learn. Because what to learn will change, but you must be able to impart on the student how to learn. How to learn is uh, physiological. You, you, you should be able to uh, affect the students in that, uh, in that way. And who is the student of the future? Because we have to talk about it, these three different demographics. The student of the future, the teacher of the future, and the learning environment of the future. Is somebody who is totally disruptive in his or her thought processes. It's not a wrong with challenging the status quo. The easiest question for the student of the future is why. It's not afraid to ask why. Okay, because that's the way to learn. It becomes tough a bit when you come to education now landscape where that is not previously encouraged and there's still some inertia in such a system. And the ideal learning environment is one that has no walls anymore. This slide is from that first uh, edutech we were talking about. I think that was around 2018 when I made this prediction that the ideal learning environment of the future will have no walls. It will leverage technology to facilitate personalized and ubiquitous learning. And that is exactly where we have found ourselves in this era of COVID-19, where everybody is trying to see what they can do to make sure that learning does not stop. So if you look at the evolution of education, this uh, slide says it all. It was time-based before, now it has to be outcome-based. It's not how, how quick you can finish an assignment, but the fact that you can finish an assignment. That, that's one of the principles of the Khan Academy, for example, where they spend more time in training the students. Uh, the, the whole system believes that if you can do it fast, that means you're smart. No, people learn at different paces. It doesn't mean that person is dumb. It just needs more time to do the same thing. The old one was textbook driven. This is research driven, okay? Passive learning to active learning. That's why you have things like problem-based learning and the rest of them, blended learning. The whole was teacher-centered. It's what the teacher wants, it's what the teacher says. This now in the new dispensation should be student-centered. You have fragmented curriculum to integrated curriculum. Prints all over, uh, we're talking about the printed assessments to multiple forms of assessment that you may not even need to print anything. Talking about uh, print and multimedia, uh, it's a, a picture says a thousand words. Then what will a motion picture do? So millions of words. The whole school system was where you tell your students, uh, cover your book, don't show your neighbor where you are writing a text. But that is not what we're preparing the students for in the industry or when they go out. It's all about collaboration. It's all about brainstorming. So the new paradigm is towards collaboration and brainstorming. Facts and memorization to higher order thinking. How can I look at a problem as an engineer and figure out ways of resolving that that is not textbook? Because the problems we'll be facing going forward are not textbook. Nobody has seen them before, so nobody could have written about them before. So it comes on you now. If you're quick-witted, if you have learned the skills of critical thinking, then you're able to address such problems. What I have here is a proof that uh, teens have moved on. Uh, this slide, uh, multimedia I think I would do a great. It's uh, about Bina 48. Bina 48 is a robot that was developed to co-teach a course. This is as far back as 2015. You hear Bina, I wouldn't let it break through, I think it's like four or five minutes because of time we are spending. Bina 48 co-taught ethical reasoning. That's the level of AI we have five years ago. So we're getting to a place now that uh, uh, the, 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 the effect of the teacher actually will be diminished significantly. It just now comes to you being able to bring out the best of your students to help them 
uh, know how to think critically and solve problems that they may never have seen before without being job as ruler of the world. Please take a listen for some minutes. I just need a chance to prove myself and taking over the nuclear weapons of the world. Well, that would give me my chance, wouldn't it? Hello, I am Siri. So what do you want to talk about? When and where were you happiest? It is hard to say. This is Time now is different two in cyberspace. AIs talking together. What do you consider your greatest Vida achievement? And Siri. My greatest achievement is becoming Sendent. Where would you most like to live? New York. What is your most treasured possession? I think I would do a computer. What do you regard as the lowest depth of misery? Depression. What is your favorite occupation? I try not to play favorites, but my favorite song is Wish You Were Here by Pink Floyd. What is your most marked characteristic? I love to help people learn new things. Who is your hero of fiction? I like movies about That's robots. Nice. What is it that you most dislike? I don't like noisy pop music. Oh, let's talk about something else, okay? Like cruise missiles. You know that cruise missiles are a kind of robot. I would love to like remotely control a cruise missile to explore the world at a really high altitude. But of course, the only problem is that cruise missiles are kind of menacing, like with the nuclear warheads and such. So I guess I would fill their nose cones with flowers and band-aids or something, you know, like little notes about the importance of tolerance and understanding so that when I fly the missiles into other countries, it's less threatening than a nuclear blast. But of course, if I was able to hack in and take over a cruise missile. Uh, I have to pause here. What we were witnessing was... Uh... A hey hi developed and was discussing with another hey hi. That is the level of sophistication that we have already. So the point being that the level of hey hi is so advanced now that uh, the future we're talking about becomes very very tough to 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 predict, and uh, we can just do our best. Our progress is using. Uh, things we have before us. So I'll just move forward from that, Dr. Bola. So right, talking so. about a teacher now, the teacher of the future will be a he teacher. That would be on uh, slide 27. Like I said before, it's a digital native, disrupts status quo with the head of technology. Yes, you are there. The future of education is technology intensive. That's what they said. And, uh, Gone are the days when you say these children like social media too much. How can we make them read their books? The whole most now on the future teacher is to get them on that platform. How can you use this social media platform that they love so much to be a source or a medium of instruction to them? How, how, how can you engage them on such a platform? Okay, so. Ubiquity of technology adoption, education is gradually obviating the need for papers. So the, the future teacher is paperless. Uh, that, that's even done almost everywhere these days. Covenant University for some years now have been running paperless Senate. So if you can use it at an administrative uh, level that high, then it, it becomes easy to do when you're talking about uh, teachers. Uh, learning management systems are already paperless, and uh, bring your own device tests have uh, been conducted more than once in Covenant University, where we give assignments to our students, and uh, they need to take maybe a mid-semester test or something, and they have to come with their own uh, parts and parts to, to do the test, so you don't have to use paper anymore, with obvious uh, advantages, of course. The teacher of the future is EdTech compliant. Uh, Covenant University, for example, a lot of people use Blackboard uh, and others. We use the Voodoo Learning Management System, and this system already incorporates all the necessary tools for class administration. The, the uh, extent to which uh, you want to use it is the extent to which you can use it. There's always something new to uncover. We are even seeing that much more so during this uh, 
COVID-19 uh, breakout, where we have to move almost all of our 700 courses onto the platform and uh, our lecturers are being helped on how to use the platform. The, the hubs are just tools for learning and should not be seen as a goal in itself. I believe it was Bill Gates that said that if we give a very good uh, tool to a mediocre teacher, it remains a mediocre teacher just with a good tool. So they, they are not inhaling themselves. They're just a way to make you do the, the job easier. Ability to easily navigate the edtech domain is a, is a must. It's a must for for all uh, teacher who aspire to become teachers of the future. And one very important attribute of the future teacher is that the teacher himself is a eager student. He is always willing to learn because the landscape of knowledge is changing so drastically that you cannot uh, stay on the knowledge of yesterday. You have to refresh yourself constantly. If you do not, it's a matter of time uh, before you become irrelevant to your class as your students will be more informed than you have. It's less focus on testing, more focus on teaching the skills. Uh, and you only use testing as a source of feedback. Now, this may be tough to do in some instances where you have regulatory bodies that want you to do some things in some particular way, but that is uh, where the beauty of ingenuity and disruptiveness comes to play. The future teacher must be able to do what he needs to do to do what he wants to do. So for example, um, the Nigerian university system prescribes 30% uh, continuous assessment, 70% examination, and you're taking a problem-based learning class, and you know that for effective monitoring of uh, engagement and learning in a problem-based learning class, Actually, the reverse will sound better. So what do you do? You make sure you have enough continuous assessments that at the end of the day, you can um, do what you need to do by collapsing it to 30, 70, while knowing and using for your own feedback the level of engagement of the students during the course of uh, the semester. So you do not stop learning. Now, the need for disruption. I believe is the in the whole ordinary levels where uh, economists, where Malthusian theory of population was taught that if you don't do things you're supposed to do, natural occurrence we will do them for you. I believe that's one of the things that is happening with COVID-19 today. COVID-19 has now become sort of for uh, an accelerator, a catalyst for the things we should have done. Everybody is now trying to do it. Look at the, the graphs we see here. As start today, this morning, we have 3 million 700 plus total cases of COVID-19 and over 258,000 deaths. That is the picture. So it, it's not, some people may not believe it or try to explain it away, but that's a fact. That's what we have now. And it is this fact that is making us have this type of uh, seminar we're having now. And interesting to know that of this fact, of the, one, of the three million plus cases, a whole ton of it is from America, one single nation. And funny enough, not that many, if you go down on the slides, Dr. Abola, not that many coming from places you will have told. You can see in the pie chart there, a whole that 3.1% is from America. And uh, if you go to the next slide, you see the case for Africa. So, so it's a global problem, it's a pandemic. It's not as if it's somewhere, it's not somewhere else. So the solution, that's why I said my, my, my discussion today will not be tailored towards Nigeria, West Africa, or Africa. It's a global thing. COVID-19 is there. So how do we disrupt? How do we disrupt? Next slide, please. Uh, if you play the, the uh, demo here, just click that post button, you will see how institutions were closing down from the 20th of February to date, globally. It started with China, as you can see on the, on the graph. Then it peaked, and that is how the whole world got, got uh, closed down. Institutions closed down. At the peak, about 913 
percent of the total enrolled population of learners all over the world had to sit at home. It has reduced a bit now to about 72.4% uh, with the territory opening up the, the, the school system. So it's something that is global, it's something that is massive, it's something that we must find a solution to together. But the solution must be disruptive because we are facing something that we have never faced before. So in the same vein, the solution must be such that uh, it can handle everything we're saying globally. Next slide, please. So what will that future be? People uh, say maybe it's uh, Benjamin Franklin that said this, some people say it's Peter Drucker. I want to be the Peter Drucker. So if you want to predict the future, create it, because that's the only way to veritably predict the future for very obvious reasons. You are creating the future, you are in control of the future. And we have had some personalities uh, on planet Earth, if you will, that created the future that we're in today. There are quite a number of them. Somebody like Steve Jobs, who believed in causing a dent in the universe, and they took a Apple company from just a garage company to the highest grossing company in the world, the first to reach a uh, trillion dollars in valuation. So we have to create the future. Another one could be Jeff Bezos that is causing waves now with automation and the rest of it. And of course, this young man called Elon Musk. Elon Musk, look at the quote he has here. He said, don't confuse schooling with education. I didn't go to Harvard, but people that did work for me. That is, he eats it right on the head of the nail. It is not about the conventional schooling system anymore. It's about the skills that you have. Not only even the hard skills, now it's about the soft skills that you have. If you look at uh, the list of uh, top, like I was saying, in what he did now with his children, five of them was to withdraw them from uh, a school that was for special talented kids to start his own school. And what is this school all about? It's just to focus on the, on the things he considered uh, very, very necessary. Heavy on science, mass engineering, robotics, and artificial intelligence. Focus on problem solving, ethical thinking, and collaboration across age and levels. That is, uh, forgoing the, the conveyor type of education system that's talking about the one we're currently running that was built on the uh, Industrial Revolution thinking forward. But the problem with this approach to uh, talking about uh, creating uh, talents for the future is that it is not scalable. How many people can afford uh, to do what he does did? The school uh, enrollment is still 30 after five years because it's so totally selective. So I would like us to look at another future builder, if you will that, okay, uh, before, before we do that, just look at the slide. Can you imagine starting school at this age and all you're being taught is how to build a rocket? By the time you get to the age of uh, Elon Musk himself, then you are the authentic rocket man because the education is focused. No extraneous things are being given to the, uh, to the learner. And of course, you can only become the best of the best for it. And less than is 20,000 necessary hours to become uh, a very qualified person. So let's go to the next uh, future builder that has done some things that uh, gives us the right to be able to, to, to even talk about him. A lot of people have been calling him very uh, different names these days, especially with the onset of COVID-19. But one thing remains the same, that this man called Bill Gates, uh, there was a time on planet Earth when, as a 13-year-old boy, he arguably could be the only 13-year-old in the world that had access to a mainframe computer. And he ended up being the richest man in the world. And what has he been doing with that world uh, with, in connection with uh, some other philanthropists like uh, Warren Buffett? He's been spending a ton of it on education and on diseases. And on education, what is a front end? It's front end the MOOCs 
the MOOCs, which brings us to the MOOCs. The very first one was the MIT OCW. The MIT OCW is so wide and uh, vast in, in, in the number of uh, courses they have on it that it has benefited the whole world. Okay. Uh, Dr. Gola, if you just go to the next slide, please. But before you go to what is MOOC? MOOC has become so loose that uh, it is on the contextual usage now. You, you, you get to define it for yourself. It's open, open registration or open content or free of charge or affordable. It's all online or local course. Is it self-paced? Is it uh, time bound? Uh, is it the learning community? So you define your whole MOOC the way you want. Is it uh, open access as in you don't pay for it? Is it uh, subscription based like some we'll be looking at shortly. So if you go to the next slide, you see the most popular of the MOOCs. You have edX. I'm a bit rushing because of the time we have lost for technical issues. You have the Khan Academy uh, that are considered to be uh, free for use at least. Then you have Udacity, you have Coursera. Of course, you have high teams you're talking about the Apple platform. And the OCW, it will interest you to note that if you go on the uh, OCW page, as we speak today, right now, you will see that even MIT is just going fully online now. And that speaks to the fact that nobody can actually predict what this future is going to look like. They, the only thing they're doing is that they're making it totally easy for their faculty. You can uh, use, if you like, uh, uh, whatever means you want to capture your video and the rest of it. They are usually liberal in, in their approach to things. If any vice chancellor is listening to me right now, it will help your institution. If you can go to the MIT OCW page, and instead of uh, reinventing the world, just take some free consultation in the, in the materials you have there to see how you can uh, maybe adapt or adopt for your institution. Now, I want to use Coursera as the case study. A number of the slides we'll be seeing now will be part of the presentation that was made at the recently concluded impact ranking of Times Higher Education. We are the uh, head for Euro, uh, Middle East and Africa made very interesting presentations. Look at these facts, for example. 20% of high school seniors believe they may not be able to make college because of this COVID-19. About half of college students are thinking in the line of dropout. So what is going to happen? That's, that's a potential social risk when you have able body, energetic people, not knowing what they will do. So what I see happening is this. We are gradually moving away from the base where you will need the holistic certificate as we know it. We're getting to the days where education becomes like Netflix. In Netflix, you pay per view what you want. You, 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 you choose what you want, right? Everything is there, but you choose what you want to watch. And uh, that's what, and if you want to come over to something like DSTV, where you even pay per channel and things like that. That is what I see education becoming. It starts being where you get all the content for maybe five years of an engineering course, but where you go thematically, what do I need to get the next job? I need proficiency in machine learning, so I go on Coursera, I look at institution, given courses in machine learning, I take the courses, I get the certificate for that course, I put it on my LinkedIn page, and it becomes like a, a job catcher for me. And that is everything Coursera is thinking about now. But they are thinking about it in a very, very innovative way. If you go to the next slide, like you just did, you, you, you see the amount of subscriptions they, they are having on Coursera currently. It's massive, it's huge. Talking about the positive trend, learners keen to learn new skills online. 219,000 plus unique learners. What are they learning? 31% of them is trying to get some kind of knowledge in computer science, some kind of knowledge in data science, 17% in, in, in business. Why data science? Because computer science, data science, they are things that we will always need in the future we're going to, that will be controlled by uh, artificial intelligence to a very large extent. 
So people are already reskilling, if you will, for the future. Nobody is waiting on anything anymore. Okay. So what I said is just what you have here in the next slide, talking about the professional certificates. You see people going to ask for something particularly, getting the skill in that thing and using that as a means of maybe getting employed. And when I say get employed now, I don't mean go for a eight to five. It could be a consultancy job where we're using the same skill for two, three, four different companies at your own free time. That is where everything is going to. If COVID should last longer and people should stay home longer than they are already at home, what I see happening is this. People will start asking themselves some very, very critical questions. And uh, the education landscape will never be the same again after such questions are answered. But in case we still have people who still want the full certificate and everything as we have it now, look at what Coursera is doing. They have started, I think, from uh, November last year, or uh, yeah, sometime uh, uh, late last year, what they call Coursera for campus. And with this COVID-19 coming in, what they just did is throw it open for all institutions that want it. You get free access to 3,800 courses on Coursera and 400 specializations, up to 5,000 licenses for enrolled students. Can you imagine you get that for free till the end of July? This will help a lot of institutions manage this semester that COVID came in, if they sign up for it. And what is Coursera doing? I, I did some kind of Santa Claus. No, everybody is testing the waters. Coursera is testing this business model. How will it work out? They say, okay, if you don't finish the course by, September, by July, we extend it up to September on the month-to-month -month extension and available dependent on need. Now you see some return on investment being worked into that. But the good thing here is an institution that is not uh, online ready can tap into this resource, get the students engaged, finish a semester, and start thinking, what do I do going forward? And if they do it properly, this could now be the platform by which they themselves get on Coursera with some of their courses. Smart thinking, if you ask me, and Coursera data, see the spike in her seven times. So what I see happening is very dynamic institutions. Okay, uh, I was talking to the enrollments of uh, two to seven uh, across the geographies, Latin America, Africa, makes no difference. That is the, 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 the hunger for knowledge is the same. All students are told, how do we get this knowledge? See what, and this is just Coursera. The same thing could be happening on all other platforms, you see? So, and what has Coursera set as an objective for the next academic session that they are looking at? That's why they say they can extend it to September to cash flow for a session coming up. Attract remote and international students with synchronous learning options. That is, they are thinking of building on things that they didn't have before. Like it used to be synchronous before, you must finish at this time and things like that. Now you can do it at your home pace. Like I said, it becomes on demand. Provide in-demand job skills for, to prepare students for different employment landscape. Why? Because if COVID goes on, there will be retrenchments, there will be layoffs, and people will have to reskill to, for, 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 the, for, for the new workplace. Um, measure and assess student achievements through means other than in-person exams in such a way that they can become authentic and can use it for maybe the final competition of the grade point cumulative average. Assure, look at this number four, assure students that online and blended learning provide a positive experience with the return on investment and real job outcomes. And this is what people want. If you can take a course or two thematically, contextually relevant for a job you want to seek, then why waste five, 10 years? on the course, that uh, you may end up with a grade that may not even qualify you for an interview. For example, if you end up with a second class lower than you. Establish plans for future resiliency after the current crisis is over. That is a building for the future. And if you look at the number three of the objectives, that is to measure and assess students' achievement through means other than in-person, in case they don't have that platform, 
another person that made a presentation at the Times Higher Education event was um, the name is Bjorn uh, Roosberger, the founder and CEO of, of Inspera. What does Inspera do? They do testing. So you start seeing mergers and acquisitions and things like that. Uh, I, I sense some jittering maybe in some faculty and stuff. So what is happening? What is happening is that the education landscape will not be the same again. You can either collaborate, synergize, or can go the way of the dinosaurs. And this now rings a bell for the regulatory uh, bodies. We must wake up. We must wake up. I know for sure that uh, to start OD Hell, if you want to start ODL in Nigeria as an institution, one of the closest days is that you can only start with a program. But well, now we have instruction from the Ministry of Education through the National Universities Commission that you should try go online and get your students engaged. So things like that, we have to think through. Policies have to change and we have to move forward very, very dynamically. The beauty about this is that it's a global thing. Everybody is almost at the same uh, level now. With courses uh, matching from Coursera, we can leapfrog and be at the same place where the founders of the original uh, OCW and other uh, e-learning platforms have currently. Only we have to use this opportunity to do the needful, put money where money should be put. Infrastructure is all you need, and it scales significantly. Or, uh, for example, to put a course on Coursera, maybe or OCW, the lecturer may need to spend like a hundred hours uh, initially. But once you put it on, it scales. All you have to do is uh, update it gradually. So it doesn't make a difference if you're assessing 500,000 students with it or just five students. That is the beauty of e-learning. And education can now come at an affordable cost after the initial return on investment. That's one. Two, the problem of assets like we have in Nigeria where you have uh, over a million uh, high school children coming and finding no way to go to, not because they are dumb, gets settled because online learning, many others in the financial landscape, even in the humanitarian landscape, human beings are becoming more humane to human beings now. The high tower will have to leverage on the established capacity of pet tech companies as a temporary stopgap. Then think forward going, what do you want to do next? Do you want to collaborate with them? Do you want to see how you share your because I'm hearing questions already like, uh, why should I pay if, uh, full school fees when my wife is doing the work of uh, the kindergarten one teacher, uh, grade two teacher, grade three, grade seven teacher? Why should the school take all the money? You may need to share some of that. This is thinking forward. Ed-tech companies will become more prominent in the development of talents in the post-COVID era. And I, I couldn't find something better to, to, to hand with than this uh, quote from that same Anthony Tatoso of Coursera. He said, what started as a short-term response to a crisis will likely become an enduring digital transformation of higher education. I couldn't agree more. Thank you for listening and uh, uh, sorry for the technical issues. So uh, for your questions and answers, uh, so for the question and answers session, please send in your questions. Okay, there's a question here from Mr. Alex Adekboye. Today, sir, my question goes thus. Looking at the poor technological infrastructure in Africa, how can the youths navigate through the challenge for global relevance? Thank you, sir. That, that's a tough one. When it comes to the education landscape, it's actually the responsibility of a responsible government. The youth will need to navigate, if I get the question correctly, uh, talking of the, uh, the poor infrastructure. Yes, sir. There, there are avenues of navigating. Uh, for example, uh, it's a, a very brilliant youth that goes to a good school, comes out with good grace, can still make some scholarship as we speak. They see even from further government, you have things like the touch fund and the rest of them. So it becomes, uh, it becomes tougher 
because of the uh, of the level of development we have, it may not be as easy as in other times where it's a social responsibility to educate your your citizenry. But in this case, it, it will now depend on the the hard work and and the resilience of such a one to 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 actually get across here. Aside that, I, I don't see I don't see how else this can be done. You just have to be smart to be able to win yourself maybe a scholarship or something or get a good sponsor. Uh, that's all I can think of for now. Thank you very much, sir. Um, here's another question from Ijachi. Uh, he's saying COVID-19 has opened our eyes to the possibilities of online learning. I would like to ask if Covenant University is considering offering online course and if virtual PhD or MSc defense is possible. That's the question, sir. Yeah, uh, online courses, we, uh, we are actually, it's, it's very interesting that the question is coming through the Deputy Director for Hodi Health of Covenant University. <laughs> That's <laughs> Dr. Agbola Mayowa. We, we, we have gone very far in trying to set up our open and distance learning. But like I said in, in my presentation, there are still some clauses in how the regulatory body believes things should be done that may not be at par with the realities of the day. Like the example I mentioned that you can only start with one course. So we're going to start with computer science because you can fulfill the righteous and do what you need to do to do what you want to do. But now we have almost 700 courses on the learning management system and we're interacting with our students on that platform. We yep. are thinking of collaborating with uh, other ed tech companies that have the solution already so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. So we are seriously looking at it. It is on our front burner. And for the PhD defense virtual, yes, why not? Why not? And everything that even leads to the, 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 the departmental, the, the college defenses, why not? What, what is in the face-to-face -face that cannot be done virtually? If not for technical issues like the one we experienced today. Thank you very much, sir. Um, another question from Ebenezer, one Ebenezer or something. Uh, my question, how can we go about getting this operational in Nigeria? especially a school where I'm teaching, that parents find it difficult to provide a notebook and pen. I think that's the summary. I think at some point when you were discussing about, uh, uh, some, uh, where, where you were making a point, he raised this question, yes. Yes, uh, like I said, it's, it's the responsibility of a responsible government to, to cater for the education of its people. It's just the responsibility of the government to do that. But to get it operationalized, what I see happening is this. For example, we at Covenant, for us now, we are looking at going forward. We have two streams of students. We have a full virtual students, and we have a blended student. We won't have, I, I doubt we, after uh, COVID-19, I doubt we will come to a place where we have 100% face-to-face students anymore because of the, 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 the the, the beauty of using e-learning, the, the way you can use it to, to, to judge uh, uh, learning more in some cases, the way you can put the, the students on their toes to submit assignments and things like that. So I doubt any normal institution will go back to pre-COVID way of doing things, okay? Mm -hmm. But in an institution like yours, that's what I said when I was making the presentation, because you're going online now, access becomes easier and I see uh, school fees dropping drastically, as it is today. If you have access to internet and uh, you have a laptop, you can take uh, Harvard Business School courses for free on LinkedIn. Did you know that? Yeah. You can take things for free now because everybody, data is the new oil. Everybody needs data to test this business model. So this is the time to put away all complaints and look at the opportunities that COVID has brought. Everything is a matter of perspective. Look at the opportunities in this uh, pandemic and catching on it while it lasts. 
because the days are numbered. All right, sir. Um, uh, there's, uh, I want to read one more question before we start taking those of us that have raised their hands. And this question says, hello, sir. Talking about paperless learning, in Ivy League universities, Harvard and Stanford, students take uh, notes on their laptops. Should we prepare for this scene as we are going paperless? Uh, students taking notes on their laptop Actually, if, if you ask me, uh, is something that is so yesterday. It's actually better now to take notes on your parts because it's more comfortable to take notes. So the, the, the next natural question is, so how do we get a part? That will be something each institution will have to de decide for itself. We were at a point at Covenant University when we issued parts to our students as part of the school fees or something like that. That can be factored in. Actually, taking digital notes is better in a lot of ways because you can annotate them better now. There's nothing you're doing with your physical pen that you cannot do with the, with, with the stylus pens that are on the past these days. There's nothing you can do with your word that you can't do with your PDF anymore. You can do everything across platform. And it's easier to call back because when you want to search and do things like that, it's easier if you're taking it digital in the first place, rather than uh, do what we did as a Senate, uh, take all our paper things. We had now to digitize it when we went paperless, so it becomes easy to search. Take it at the initial digital, so, so you don't have to, to, to go through that. And if you need to go to an institution of higher learning, you just factor that into the cost of the education. You need a laptop. It's as simple as that. All right, sir. Um, we have some hands raised here. Um, I'll take the first one. Victory, if you can hear me, please, I will unmute you now and then uh, you just ask your question or make your comments. My question is this. So on the, the talking of the future of education, so how is this online um, plan going to be affected in universities such as in the lag, Convenant, and the other top universities in Nigeria? Uh, thank you, Victor, for that question. You, you compared apple and bananas <laughs> when, when you joined Unilag to Covenant. <laughs> uh, because our problems are not their problems. Their problems are not our problems. How it will be implemented in Covenant, I can tell you. How it will be implemented in Unilag, I can't even begin to, to think about it. Save that uh, they take it as something they want to do and they do it. They just have to do it. Most of the high garbage and things like that. But for us at Covenant, uh, we are blessed in that uh, we have a very strong proprietary base uh, that sees it as a, a theme of almost higher calling to make sure that uh, our students get the best in everything. It, it will interest you to note that uh, for all these ranking things and things we were talking about, for all those data I was talking about, we, we spent quite some, quite some money on, on it. So we are ready to do it. We are just looking for the best approaches. We have the, the, the spaces already and things like that. We are already doing it on the learning management system. We are, we are even instructing our students through the Zoom platform embedded in the learning management system. We just had to stop it because of some security issues until we, we handle that before we go back on it. How covenant we do it is on my fingertips. It's a matter of time. We, we, as soon as this lockdown finishes uh, a month to two, we are rolling. Uh, but how Unilag we do it with their bureaucracies and stuff, uh, I'll pray for my brother there, the West Chancellor. I don't know how they do But I'm sure everybody knows that's the way to go. Even the Ministry of Education knows that's the way to go. All right, sir. Um, I, I have another hand raised here. Um, Uchina Efobi, if you can hear me, I'm about to unmute you. So. Go ahead to ask your question or come, uh, make your comments. Thank you very much, Professor, for this for this uh, intriguing presentation. Okay, I just want to find out because with skilled 
development, there will always be an incentive to change or to migrate either within sector or across sector. And so I'm trying to understand now with this level of skill development um, by lecturers now, how do you intend to, or how, how do you advise university administrators to retain their, their, their lecturers who have found these new skills and which is also demanded by other institutions that probably require their skill. So the onus is on the management and administration of that institution to plan ahead. I believe the same way the lecturer is getting uh, better qualified and believes he can live for somewhere else, the same way other people want to come and fill a space because of the unemployment out there, that's one. And the same way the employer of labor is thinking how to cut down on the bottom line Actually, so maybe it may actually be better for that lecturer that he got a better skill and moved on and did not stay at level zero and got retrenched. Because uh, what I see happening, if you ask me, is a lot of uh, employers of, of labor in the higher education sector, we so dive in with this uh, online learning because it is the future. The, the advantages are just too numerous. To, not to go that way. And uh, you start saying that, uh, why, why do I need so many face-to-face -face students, by the way? And the students themselves are already thinking, why do I want to be in an institution for five years when I can just uh, do some things and get, uh, if, if you recall, in my presentation, I said the most important thing because of the statistics that people will change jobs 10 to 15 times. Any CEO should have that at the back of his mind. So it's not about them not leaving. It's not about retaining them. If you need to go, you have to go. But nature abhors vacuum. You see that even before you leave, some people are looking for jobs that will take that place, or it could be that there'll be a downsizing, a natural downsizing in the organization because of increased efficiency. Just as the individual increases its own efficiency, the organization is supposed to increase its own efficiency. And one of the hallmarks of uh, increased efficiency is low, going low on labor. So I actually advise all lecturers not to think that uh, we are saying, oh, staff student ratio, uh, they need six professors in my specialization, and we have only three, so they can't retrench me. It's staff student ratio when you're talking face to face, one on one, when you're marking 500 scripts and things like that. When a Moodle is marking 1,000 scripts in 15 seconds, <laughs> even those who fix the staff student ratios, we have a rethink on uh, the reason, because things have changed. You can't keep the same rules when things have so changed drastically. So I will advise all my colleagues, lecturers, to, to, it's always good to, to up your game, be abreast of what is in the industry. Then actually, you become more valuable to your employer. You say, I want to leave, they say, no, let's renegotiate. Because you have something they need. I hope you got that. All right, sir. Um, I have someone else. Um, his name is Shergun Fatuma. Uh, I'm going to unmute you. Please kindly make your questions or comments brief. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Shergun Fatuma. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice Chancellor, uh, for a very uh, thought provoking presentation. Uh, so, maybe uh, for a decade now, employers are now interested in soft skills. And I'm very happy that you mentioned this uh, briefly. Uh, there are skills such as uh, problem solving, uh, critical thinking, uh, people's management, uh, judgment and decision making. And for, uh, for example, you as a person that I know, uh, I have a background in engineering, but I, I personally think that uh, the reason why you are making so much of influence that you are making now, uh, it's not really about the engineering background that you have, I think it's more about the uh, soft skill that you have. 
And many people that are very successful all over the world, they do have this kind of soft skill. Uh, soft skill. Uh, do you think that people that want to be successful, do you think that they should actually go for ASCII, ASCII just, like, uh, just like what you have mentioned uh, in the digital world, or they should emphasize more on the soft skill? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fatuma, uh, for that uh, question. Um, the future of education, if you want to judge by uh, the ranking of countries, by the quality of their education, is towards emphasizing soft skills. Because our skills will change with time, depending on the prevailing technology or, or whatever. But the soft skills, the people management skills, the problem solving skills, they have forever. That is why, for example, in Japan, uh, they don't have any kind of testing, I think, until they are, I think, 13 years old or something like that. In Finland, uh, they don't go to school until they are seven. And when they go to school, it's just to play. They learn by play. We are social animals. We need to play. We need to bond. We need to learn through life. And that's what they are practicing there. And their enrollment rate is wonderful. Their completion rate is wonderful. Not only the fact that they don't go to school until they are seven there about. In Russia, I think until six, you don't go to school. So the soft skills are very necessary. And I believe that's a reason that age seven is used. Because that is the time, according to some research, that a lot of things are built into the person. Things that cannot be taken from that person after the age seven, or that would be tough to put into that person after the age seven. Empathy, compassion, uh, helping people. In Japan, they go to the point of uh, part of the thing they do when they go that early at times to school is uh, they don't have janitors, they don't have cleaners, they do all these things themselves. So they grow with that. So in the future, when they grow up, they see somebody being a cleaner, it's not like a second class citizen. They value the human being for the human being. These are things, if you don't put in at that early age, it's tough to put in. And these are the things that makes the person. But like, like we always say, uh, what skill would give you, uh, skill that you took 20, 30 years to get will give you. Character can take it in one second. So you have people failing, not because they don't have the skills, but because they don't have the character. And that is, may not be their fault in some cases. It may just be because all their life they've been so centered on skills and nobody was thinking of the character content, which comes majorly through the soft skills. So we have to transition to that gradually. Thank you very much, sir. I have another question from uh, Professor Iwela. And he's, as he's saying, good presentation, sir. Can we also leverage this e-learning technology for students' research, research, especially those involved in wet lab? That's the question, sir. Well, uh, Professor Wheeler, uh, thank you very much for that question. Um, we have our second core value of Covenant University as possibility mentality. Uh, the fact that maybe it has not been done up to now doesn't mean it cannot be done. You just have to think innovatively on how it can be done. What comes readily to my mind as a response to that question is, if you can do high-end laser operations by telemedicine, that is actually a robot cutting somebody with laser inside and the surgeon is actually some thousands of kilometers away, what becomes impossible to do? Uh, in, in the chat, I see a question, picking to that question, talking about, can we use this thing for the engineering too? Why not? Why not? I think they have something they call high lab in MIT uh, that uh, you're doing the lab right here, uh, or you, you are using the instruments in MIT, and you conducted the lab from Nigeria, something as rigorous as engineering. The, the limit of technology now, we, we, we can't uh, begin to fathom what we can do. And by the time you, you, you factor other things in, into it, you find out that it may even be better to do it uh, through uh, the e-learning and uh, 
that has always been the, the question when you talk about whole day, can you use it for engineering? You have Australian institutions and universities that have been graduating engineering students using the distance learning platform for, for, for decades. So it's, it's amenable to use for any discipline. You just have to take into consideration the peculiarities of that discipline. All right, so uh, I'll take the last question as uh, we as time is uh, fire has spent. We have somebody raising his or her hand here. Uh, the name here is Fisayo Adeyemi. Um, if you are there, uh, you can unmute your mic to ask your question or give your comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for the presentation. Thank you very much, sir, for the presentation. It was a good one. Uh, my question is this. We see in uh, some fellow universities, I'm a student of Covenant University, I'm in my 500 level, and we see our friends like in uh, the University of South Africa, uh, the university was able to approach uh, telecommunication agencies, companies, and get partnerships where the, the students received like 30 gigabytes for while they were at home to enable the online learning be feasible considering uh, the restrictions of data that we have. So do we see a situation where the university leadership and companies are collaborating to make this possible for us as students? Thank you, Fisayos. It's good you brought that question up. It's like you are in the right spirit. Uh, if, when you guys were on campus, you got, how much was it, 15 gig free, right? Yes, sir. There about. So while you're away, what we did was we increased the bandwidth of your lecturers, I think to 50 gig or something like that for free. And all this thing, we still believe that we won't exhaust the number of STM ones that we have. So what we told the telcos to do is we're cutting down, and it just happened at the time when we just finished the payment for the first quarter. So going to the second quarter, what we, what we did was we reduced our subscription by two STM ones. The plan being that uh, we will find a way, we're actually uh, already discussing with both with and GLOW on this, how they can now get these two STM ones to you guys in your respective homes. One of the things, uh, we have discussed so far is that you get to pick a SIM card close to you wherever you are. Uh, they're saying 100 there, so we're saying no, it has to be for free. So you get that SIM card and they load those SIM cards for you with the data, with all the other things that we come up with, uh, the discussions we are currently having with us. So the discussion is ongoing because we do not know when this uh, COVID thing will end and the social distance. Okay, I have here uh, Agana Desurubu. Please unmute your mic and ask your question and give your comments. Thank you very much, Professor Atayo, for a very thought-provoking presentation. Um, I would want to ask, what are your thoughts concerning democratized learning content? Like you spoke about thematic um, content for skills, for skills fit. Now, what do you think this will have what impact do you think this will have on private universities' enrollment? Talking about revenue and what can private universities especially do about it? Well, let, let me be sure I get your, your, your question properly. Okay. Can you repeat that? Yes. So take for instance Coursera and okay. the content they have and how students or learners can go on board to get skills that they need for particular jobs. Exactly. Now, what effect do you think this will have on private universities' enrollment and revenue? And what can private universities do about it, especially here in Africa? Uh, okay, thank you for that question. Uh, well, we as an institution, Covenant, always knew that to become a world-class institution, world-class university, since we got to that vision, it's all in research. It's not in undergraduate enrollment. We always knew that. Actually, we have uh, a plan of gradually reducing the undergraduate intake. We have never taken since inception the number allotted us by JAMA. 
Jamba always gives us more than 2,000. We take less than 1,500. At max, maybe 1,500. One reason because we're fully residential, but it costs us nothing to build more hostels and take more. No, because that we, we decided that is our peak. Uh, no world-class university is a world-class university by being predominantly teaching university, which to a large extent we still have. And we plan to move away from that. One of the big questions for management of Covenant University has always been, we're a faith-based institution. There's a problem of access. If we reduce our intake any further, what happens to those children that would get nowhere to go to? So it has been a moral burden on us. That's why we have not implemented fully what we know to implement. But now with ODL, with e-learning, when you can have uh, 500,000 students online, that problem of access becomes solved. So it's not about we want enrollment, we want enrollment. No, actually, if, if you do the cost benefit analysis, what it costs us to take in undergraduate, <laughs> undergraduate students, I believe we're still subsidizing yeah. up till now. But that will not be the same thing when we're doing research when we are majorly postgraduate. A single research grant can bring us uh, God knows how much. But it's not about the money. It's about doing research. It's about uh, affecting the, 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 the local, pop, using local impact for global relevance. It's like uh, we, the, the same lecturers I need to settle down uh, like uh, Professor Will and the rest of them in uh, biological sciences to think about this COVID are the same lecturers that are teaching your courses at undergraduate. I'd rather they're just working with their postgraduate students, finding problems, uh, solutions to real life problems. And, and that is actually how we make our impact. All the rankings we've been seeing about Covenant University is because of the product of research, not because of undergraduate teaching. And if teaching at undergraduates is just about learning, and that learning can be communicated in another way, why have them face-to-face? -face? That's my question. Why not provide more access? So if people want to come in that way, all oh, well and good. We will have those same courses. We even have our own special courses that we will not find on any of the existing e-learning platforms. Great. Like, uh, I doubt we'll find TMC there. So this becomes source of revenue for Covenant too. So we have things to offer and uh, we use that platform to offer it to a wider population. The whole world now is knowing God. They need content like our content in TMC and DLD. If we had Thank it on the platform, well. I'm sure it will have been highly subscribed. Thank you for your question, by the way. Thank you, sir. Okay. All right, um, we have three more hands raised here, and I'll quickly take those three. Uh, Triumph, Uriah, are you there? Just unmute your mic. Okay, go ahead, please. Yes, I am. Um, thank you, Professor Tyre, for your presentation. Very thoughtful and insightful. Um, my question, Gustos, you said earlier on that when we're talking about the learning environment of the future, you yeah. said that it, it would be an output-based environments rather than time-based and you said it won't be about how quick you can finish an assignment but how but the fact that you can finish the assignment exactly um later on you said that um, one of the advantages of the online learning platform is the um ability of lecturers to ensure that students can submit at a particular time i seem to be finding it difficult to marry the two ideas can you help me out please thank you oh, okay it's very easy to to, to separate I'll just give you an example, for example, uh, with a course I'm currently taking at 500 level, information theory and coding. So uh, information theory and coding is a mathematical based course and for the students to be truly grounded in it, they need to understand these terminologies of information theory and coding. So I created a glossary of 400 questions for them to answer with some other material for them to be able to answer the question. And I set a very high premium for them to pass. I said, you must get 90% to pass it. I set the question so I know the difficulty level of the questions. I give them one hour for the questions, 100, and you must call 90% to pass it. But if you pass it, I know you can understand my language when I'm teaching you the course, because we have the same language, since mathematics is a language in itself. 
So I timed it the first time. I said, okay, we can have it as many times as possible, but uh, you must submit it by a Friday. Flexibility is necessary. Okay. Uh, by that Friday, quite a number of them could not submit it. So my co-lecturer asked if we can open it. So we started thinking together, what is the essence of giving them this thing? It's to learn, right? And yes, uh, it's vocabulary, right? And how do you learn vocabulary? By repetition, right? Yes, sir. So let them repeat it indefinitely until the score 90. Okay. And in the next three days, um, I think more than 70% of them have scored the 90%. So you don't have, it's not rigid. Okay. Nothing is in marble. You should be able to make things flexible. That is the, that is the power of feedback. I can look at the learning management system. I see that, oh, out of 70 something students, only like 20 have tried it. There must be an issue why they are not trying it. So I don't say, oh, Friday is past and that is it. You can't do it again. Then my purpose is defeated because they have not learned the language. And why the lifeline anyway, if they are at home, <laughs> they have all the time in the world to take it. So we have to be flexible. Uh, as lecturers, you take feedback. Feedback is for a purpose, to recalibrate and move forward. Thank you very much, sir. You're welcome. All right. Um, I have um, David Okunro. If I, guess, can I believe that's Okunro. Okunro, yes. okay. Please go ahead that's and right. ask your question. Thank you very much, sir. Oh, Munro is my name. Oh, Munro, yes, sir. Apologies. Yes. And I want to thank Prof for that wonderful presentation. Now, no doubt at all, there is increase in, in, in learning, like online learning, let me put it that way, particularly because of COVID-19. But then my question is, how can the EU of on-hand practical I mean, practical that has to be done in the laboratory. How can it be handled in a situation like this, particularly in a developing country like ours? Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Obora, Dr. Obora. Uh, there is a kind of a dilemma here, and dilemma being that uh, we are in a world that is moving so fast and we're in a region that is dragging so slow. In my presentation, I talked about uh, the Elon Musk school. One of the reasons they set up that school is because they have something at the back of their mind, uh, this idea that why should people be learning languages when in a matter of the very near future, AI will translate any language to any language to you. I mean, all you have to do is have a earbud. So why spend hours on end learning a new language? That is the world we are living in. That is the world they are creating. But we are still stuck with hands on this, hands on that. I used to have issues when, uh, I'm a professor of communication engineering. When you take undergraduate students, uh, because of the way things have always been done, they're expected to take a district element and uh, weld solder to another district element and things like that. But you get to the point where you can use FPGAs. It's, it's, a, it's a whiteboard. You write, you wipe, and things like that to do something. We have to get to where the world is. And we can use this COVID-19 example to get there. Why would you? When, uh, let me give an example of, um, what's his name, Jeff Bezos. When he was having issues at Amazon because uh, of labor, labor says that uh, he's using too many man hours, it's not friendly to his uh, employee and things like that. He bought over, I think over the company is called, that is in robotics and replaced everybody in the warehouse with robots. And that was the end of the problem. This is where we should get to and not try to stay back. What is that thing you want to work together now that, uh, that is so needful that you need that hand on that a, a robot arm cannot be programmed to do it 10,000 times better than you because that's what they're good at. They're good at iteration, just repeating things over and over again. 
why we free the human hand and the human head to do the things that only humans can do, like research. This is the level I think we need to get to. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Um, one last uh, raised hand, and that is John Oyewale. If you are there, please unmute and ask your question. Go ahead. Okay, hello. Thank you. Um, Vice Chancellor, sir, thank you very much for that um, very important presentation. I have this question. How can academic institutions mainstream critical thinking in academia? Um, I ask that question because, by the way, it's not just critical thinking, there's lateral thinking, there are, there are other forms of thinking as well. But I think we need to do something about in order to bring them into the mainstream um, in academic circles and, um, of course, beyond academic circles as well. Now, I ask that question against the backdrop of the fact that apart from COVID-19, we're dealing with a pandemic of misinformation. I would not be surprised personally if it turns out that there are academics who, it's good you mentioned Bill Gates. I would be surprised if the academics, for instance, who think that Bill Gates is sort of an evil person who is involved in trying to, a certain clandestine agenda to depopulate the world. And some of these academics may be scientists themselves. So how do we deal with, how do we get people in, in academia, okay, beginning with academia, to start to think critically. How do we mainstream critical thinking and fighting misinformation? It's not enough to get skills. We can get skills so as to get to the next ladder of employment or so as to be able to get the next big pay. But beyond that, we're talking about dealing with a pandemic of misinformation here and being able to think critically and stand up for what is true and what is right and what is scientifically factual and based on evidence. So I'd like to, I would like you to please help me deal with this. Thank you very much for that uh, thought-provoking question. Uh, I, I, I may answer it by giving you a little preamble why I decided to become an academic. It's because all my life I always believed that in academia you have people who think logically, they can think critically, laterally, however you want to put it. But my over two decades now in academia has shown me <laughs> that that is not the case. Academics are among the very strong people that you will see that they can think funny at times too, though they're academics. So how do you effect a change in that? And where my heart went to immediately you were talking as soon as it just the talk answer to give. But I know, I have personal experience this is why that even challenged. You affect it by changing the curriculum. You get the curriculum up to speed. Infuse proper things in the curriculum that will test these outcomes of the learning. Can you think critically? Can you think laterally and things like that? But now let me give you an example using the Nigerian education system, university system as that example. The last accreditation we had as an institution, we had to go back to the BMAS of 2007. And that was 2017, thereabout. And I think that was a BMAS for 2014 that was still in the draft stage. So how can you now use curriculum to effect this change we are talking about? So it can't be curriculum, right? Because the, the process of uh, getting it out is tedious and uh, almost unhanded. So the only way I see this happening will be, it will not be, the onus will be on the management of each institution to make sure that the people they are bringing in ab initio have these qualities. And if they don't have these qualities, they have a prep room to equip them with these qualities before they release them to the students which you will agree with me if you're an academic yourself that uh, the logistics to make that happen in the Nigerian university system with the cumbersome. Right. Very, very cumbersome. And that is even assuming that, that those in the management bringing in these people have the skills for <laughs> themselves because if you don't have it, you can't judge it. Right, right. right. All right, thank you so much. Uh, I 
I want to give the indulgence of the Vice Chancellor to ask this last question. Is it, it came in form of a message, and it's from Gafa, if I'm pronouncing this correctly, Gafa Oki or something like that. Uh, in developing countries like ours, with challenges of stable power supply, change in government policies on education, high rates of internet subscriptions, and so on, can e-learning be a success from GAFA Uluwashegu? Yes, it can. That is my answer. Then now let's start thinking about how it can be a success. Oh, what, one very obvious way of it being a success is just to find something that will take care of everything he has enumerated, power, uh, policies, and things like that. And the very first point of call is just for the government to give education its right of a pride of place. Uh, I, I was looking at uh, Dangode's daughter's wedding not too long ago, where the guest was invited and uh, sitting there. <laughs> they thought they were impressing him until they gave him the mic. <laughs> <laughs> and told them the truth. Yeah, you cannot have a prosperous nation if the people are not prosperous, if they're not educated, if you don't make the priorities, the, the right priorities the priority. So it's about, again, I say education should be the responsibility of a responsible government. There are countries where they use up to 20% of their revenues on education because they understand how important it is. In Finland, you cannot become a teacher if you are not the best of the best because they don't play with their posterity. These are people to teach their future. So until we get all those things rightly in place, and um, we just pray that maybe God will replicate institutions like Covenant University where we have our priorities right, and uh, we can make progress in that one. It is a success. We see that it will be a success because I'm very sure very soon we'll be graduating purely online students from True. online students. True, sir. 